Hi. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for inviting me to be here, Danny and uh, John and uh, Paul. Um, I think that uh, I'd like to address something that I think is a big wedge issue. I think that Canada presently is crippled. I don't think it's completely broken. And I think the biggest problem that we have is foreign fingers in the pie. I want you to know that the material I'll be talking about today is something that was prepared long in advance before Premier Kenny ever established the Alberta Inquiry and it was done for the edification of the public. There's no commercial interest involved. We do not represent any industry or any party. We simply look at the science, we look at the policy, and we look at the economic factors associated with these things. So on April 17th, 2018, um, PPHB Energy Bankers in Houston said that Canada has become, it has evolved into a hostile location to do business. And just a few short years before, we were one of the best places in the world to do business. So Canada is a great nation. It's suffering from too many foreign fingers in the pie. And that's killing our economy. It's killing our pride. It's creating breaches between regions. And I'm going to show you what I think the problem is. So the Canada that we created is being torn apart. The Canada that we built was built by our forefathers and foremothers in, uh, with determination, with vision, and with a strong view to the future and working together, sharing our resources and sharing whatever nature granted to each part of the country. Our rich resources now are being denigrated. Our people are being demoralized. And we have a country with rule of law. We have due process of law. We have thousands of people in various levels of government who work on environmental issues to make sure that the environment is protected and that energy projects go forward appropriately. We don't need these foreign funded protesters interrupting that process. It's not that we don't have due process to approve these things. So why do we have Zipporah Berman fomenting rage? Why do we have Greenpeace getting a European bank to not fund Canadian energy projects? Who are these people representing? Who's paying for them? Now in this, The Art of War, which was written by Sun Tzu, he said that to fight and conquer all your battles is not supreme excellence. Supreme excellence is breaking the enemy's resistance without fighting. So based on the research I'll present, in my opinion, Canada's resistance is being broken in the cruelest way through the use and abuse of your goodwill and our charitable hearts. And that is the Tar Sands Campaign. The Tar Sands Campaign, as you all know from Vivian Krause's excellent work, but it is a foreign and Canadian funded green trade war that is dividing and destroying Canada. Though the groundwork had been started in the 1990s, by 2011, Canada and particularly the Alberta oil sands were hated worldwide. And that's thanks to over 100 groups that were strategically coordinated by corporate ethics in the United States. And it says that right on their website. They're proud of it. So who are those foreign fingers? Well, I don't think it's just that 100 group, that group of 100. I think it's also related to the Climate Works Foundation. This is a group of 13 green billionaires. They are located in the United States, but they're not all American foundations. They are putting $600 million a year into ENGOs worldwide because they want to establish a global cap and trade program. They want carbon pricing and they want to put trillions of dollars of their vested interest renewables on the grid. So they fund local groups, local ENGOs, to push for their policies to make it look like this is a grassroots demand. And 
Many of these foundations were investigated in the 1950s by the Risi Committee in the United States, and they found that these foundations, in fact, have too much power and no oversight. So that is probably amplified many times over today. So we have four reports that Robert Lyman produced. Robert Lyman is an Ottawa energy policy consultant. He was in public service for 27 years. He was a diplomat for 10 years. So he compiled these independently from uh, Vivian Krause's material. Like he independently did it, he didn't use her material at all. So it confirms her findings and it also expands on her findings in that he gives the inside view of someone who's worked in government for so many years. So one of the things that happens when you have tax benefits to a charity is that the contributors get a tax write-off, so our tax pool loses money, but also whatever they're doing is suddenly crowned with a halo of virtue and goodness. So if you're protecting polar bears and you're protecting trees and you're protecting whales and you're a charity, then obviously you're doing something good, right? So how can you even argue against it? And that's what's happened with Canadians. We have seen these people speaking up on behalf of the vulnerable elements of nature or vulnerable populations in our society and said, oh, I guess they're doing something good. And we've never looked at what they're doing bad. We've never looked at what they're doing to destroy our economy or our reputation. Now, what does a Canada Revenue Agency define as a charitable agency? It's charitable activity is something that should be tangible, it should be local, it should be measurable, and it should provide a net public benefit. These are the parameters under which a group is granted charitable status. So an example would be, say, the Halifax Food Bank providing X number of, of food hampers to X number of Haligonians. That's tangible, it's local, it's measurable. Climate change is none of those things. Now what's happened is that these ENGOs have become far more powerful than political parties. Um, in the first report, Robert Lyman examines the relative financial strength of the top 40 ENGOs. That's not all the ENGOs that there are. That's just the top 40. And they have, um, in between 2000 and 2018, they received over 18 times the revenues of all the major political parties put together. They received 27 times the revenues of free market think tanks. So billions of dollars have gone into these organizations. The revenues of tides alone was more than the combined revenues of the liberal and conservative parties. There have been tides of cash flowing into the country. Tides aggregate of $78 million, 21 million of that was received from foreign funds. They had 800 grants, um, meaning that they were running about, uh, eight, they had 800 grant making activities that were worth about $34 million. And Tides does do some good things for society, but they also fund these things that are blocking our economic progress. In this report, Dark Green Money, we find that Tides had two charities established in the 1990s. That's a long time ago. And um, part of the Tides leadership was directly related to that of Tides in the US until 2010. Um, at one point, they were the principal funder of Zipporah Berman's Forest Ethics, which successfully blocked Northern Gateway. In 2010, the Oak Foundation funded Tides for $50,000 to develop a plan to fund some or $30 million fund in Canada from 100 to 200 high net worth Canadian and international donors. So what happens in this report is you'll see that what began with foreign funding quickly morphed into Canadian funding. And now you are all being taken for granted. These guys have started a, ca a cottage empire and built it into a castle empire. They have um, 
millions of dollars that they've received from foreign funds, but now they also have amazing network of lobbyists in Ottawa. You want to know why your voice is not being heard in Ottawa? You want to know why when the United We Roll convoy comes to town in Ottawa, nobody comes to say hi? It's because that Ottawa is rife with lobbyists for these ENGOs. For instance, in the 12-month period from the publication of this report, CAP had 12 registered lobbyists and they conducted 125 lobbying efforts. These ENGOs had 95 registered lobbyists and they conducted 250 lobbying efforts. So now we see that these ENGOs are substantially better funded. They have massive lobbying and political activism, which is afforded by such funding. They've uh, devoted over $7 million to political expenditures. They have massive human resources and people power. They have the ability to finance legal action. And even if you're a big oil company, and I'm not speaking on behalf of big oil, I'm speaking with the voice of Robert's research. Even if you're a big oil company and you have the money to defend yourself, you know, it looks bad because all of a sudden now you're in court and now you're fighting a nuisance suit. You came to Canada to invest, to build a pipeline. The NEB had very clear, fair rules. You followed all the rules. They approved your pipeline and now you're in court. Well, what did you do wrong? So this is why uh, PPHB has said that this is a hostile place for investment now. And what's worse? This is worse. Taxpayers are now in a tiny boat adrift facing a green Titanic. And why is that? Because this spring, the federal government passed a law that instead of spending 10% of revenues on nonpartisan political activity, Charities can now spend 100% of their revenues on nonpartisan political activity. So how can you, an individual, a politician, an industrial leader, how can you compete with that? And these are tax subsidized groups. So you're paying them to fight you, against your will actually. So federal and provincial governments in Canada now provide also $170 billion per year in grants and contributions to registered charities. Charities then raise an additional $80 billion a year based on private contributions, and there's then a loss to the federal treasury of $5 billion a year. And we don't even know what the cost to provincial treasuries is. So there's a fellow named Mark Bloomberg he has a group called uh, globalphilanthropy.ca and he's an expert in charities law. He testified to the Senate last year when they were proposing to pass this legislation and he said, we know that Canadian charities claim to spend about $25 million a year on political activities, but if they have expenditures of over $250 billion a year, in theory, they could in fact already spend $25 billion a year on such political activities. So in other words, under the old rules, the charities could spend a thousand times more funds on political activities than that which they claim to spend. The 10% rule is not enough for them. They want 100%. But there's a difference between free speech and subsidized speech. And that will hide barely partisan agendas that can undermine public confidence in the sector. So you remember this fall when the Bernier camp took a, a contrarian position on climate change and remember how all those ENGOs screamed bloody murder, oh, our freedom of speech is being impinged upon. It wasn't. It was not at all. They still had the opportunity to speak freely. It was that they were not going to be able to use your tax dollars to push their agenda during a, an, a federal election. So. If you'd like to have a look at how these funds are affecting your future, your jobs, your economy, our country, we did a case study. This is Friends of Science, not Robert Lyman. This looks at Bill C-48 and how it began. 
So it began with just a $97,131 grant from the Oak Foundation, which is in Switzerland. But when you read this grant document, it's very interesting. They quite clearly state this is to constrain development of the Alberta tar sands through a legislated tanker ban, and this would necessitate the cancellation of Northern Gateway. So how is that charitable activity? That's the question we have to ask every single time. How is this charitable activity? So now that Canada has become hostile to investment, how can we get our reputation back? And, and how can we stop these people from doing this? And again, this doesn't mean that there can't be public debate about the oil sands or the energy sector or where a pipeline goes. That's been the par for the course in Canada for 50 years. That's what the NEB was all about. Uh, what, what has changed is that now everybody's uh, an expert and everybody has a say and there's no end to debate. The previous process set clear parameters so that there was fair hearing and there was an end to debate at some point so that work could go on. And we're now in a limbo land where nothing can go on because we have BLC C48 and BLC 69. Um, the other, the other thing that I think is the worst thing of all, and that is the intentional demoralization of Albertans, specifically Albertans. Um, this is Climate George Marshall. He's from the UK. He's a lifelong anti-oil activist. Um, he's being paid to come here with taxpayers' money federal taxpayers' money, Alberta taxpayers' money, to run this Alberta Narratives project. And his objective is to have table talks with Albertans and tell them that, you know what, you're going to have to find a new job because nobody wants your oil anymore. Nobody's going to use oil anymore. Really? Well, you look at that graph over there from BP, and you can look at the same kind of graph from the US EIA from the International Energy Agency or any other qualified source, and you will see that they all forecast a nonstop rise in the use of oil, gas, and coal. And it little tiny, thin, teeny tiny orange line in there, that's renewables. So there's no way that we're gonna be off fossil fuels any near, any, any time soon. That's just not gonna happen. And the other thing that you notice and um, I think, in a way, Canadians are quite naive because we are in North America, we're separated from all the other um, geopolitics of the world, and like Europe. But, you know, when you look at the geopolitical context, you can see that we're in the top six competitor nations, but we're the only nation facing this green trade war. The only one. So. How has this affected all of Canada? Well, starting in the 2000s, some $11 million in foreign funding was dumped into Quebec. It went to a group called the Global Call for Climate Action. Well, not all of it went to them, but a big chunk did. And it's also known as tick-tick-tick.org. They now claim to have 470 nonprofit partners in 70 countries worldwide that are opposed to fossil fuels. So there goes Energy East, right? In 2005, the Sierra Club funded by Oak to push GHG regulations in Canada to make it appear grassroots. Um, they also created a climate action fund. They also coordinated ENGOs because all these groups act as a group whenever they're on a campaign. How can you fight back? That was um, the same year that the Sierra Club gave Alberta an F and gave Ontario a B plus. That was the start of the tar sands campaign here in Canada. But this also killed the industrial heartland, the Green Energy Act. One minute. One minute? Okay. Okay, thanks. So, so one of the problems is there's no public debate on these issues. The umbrella of climate change and virtue signaling is uh, driving almost every policy, but climate change, 
contrary to the CRA charitable designation, is not a local, tangible, or measurable thing. These groups are doing immeasurable harm to Canada, and there is no net benefit that I can see. Now, activists insist that we should meet Paris targets, but Paris is not a binding agreement. And uh, the emissions from China and Can India by uh, alone may reach 20 billion tons by the year 2030, and that's more than the IPCC and Extinction Rebellion say that all countries should admit. So for Canada to survive, we must learn to value our economic, social, and national unity goals, as well as our environmental goals. It's not just the oil industry that's threatened by climate policies. It's all energy-intensive industries. It's all consumers, all citizens. It's all of you, and it's all of us. So things that we can do, expose this campaign, investigate these campaigns, mitigate them somehow. Even though it seems like the horse has left the barn, I think once people see this and know this, they'll be mad and they'll speak up. And make this subversion of tax dollars as a public policy issue at all levels of government. We have to restore confidence in our people, our industry, and our resources, and we have to unfriend ENGOs. Thank you.